Hello, and thank you for joining us for today's message. I'm Eric, the lead pastor of South Mountain Community Church. Thank you for taking just a bit of your time to be with us today. Uh, we exist for one reason, and that's to help as many people as possible take their next step towards becoming fully devoted and fully delighted followers of Jesus Christ. And I know that for so many people, church and even religion can be messy and oh so complicated, but it doesn't have to be that way. Here you can belong before you believe. So our hope is that your first visit with us is enjoyable, meaningful, and unlike the church experiences of your past. We also think that the best way to experience delight is with others in person. So SMCC is about more than just a Sunday sermon. We have five locations for you to choose from where you can connect with people in authentic community. We want every message you hear to engage your head, your heart, and your hands for a life of full delight. So with all of that in mind, enjoy today's message. All right, well, good morning. It's good to see you guys here today. I'm Eric, if we haven't met, and uh, I get to serve as one of the pastors here. Um, and you are here on a fantastic Sunday because today we are beginning a brand new series called Hot Ones. And uh, we figured this is the best way to wrap up a rather hot summer. And in this series, we are going to be studying the spiciest, most difficult things that Jesus ever taught together. And I think this is going to prepare us for the fall. Um, and there's one huge reason why we are doing this series. Um, if you got the notes when you walked in, if you like to follow along, you can fill the notes in or take a picture of this. Here's why we are doing a series like this. Sometimes the hardest truths to learn are the truths that we need to learn the most. And that's why we are doing a series like this. Sometimes the hardest truths, the most difficult truths to learn are the truths that we need to learn the most. So I would imagine that for some of us in the room, this series will challenge us. This series will be difficult for us. There will be some things that will be hard for you to hear. And perhaps there will be some things that you just don't like. And listen, that would be normal. That would be oh so normal. You might be tempted to reject some of the ideas or dismiss some of the ideas or tune out for some of the ideas. That would be normal. We are not the first culture, the first group of people, or the first generation to struggle with the things that Jesus taught, the things that Jesus said. In fact, in the first century, as Jesus began to call his followers, we're talking weeks or months into this whole thing, one day Jesus was talking about who he is and what he came to do, and the disciples responded with something that I think reflects maybe our approach, maybe my approach, to some of these difficult things. It's recorded for us, the conversation is recorded in John chapter six. Take a look at this. On hearing it, many of his disciples said, they said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? In the modern vernacular of today, Jesus, this is a bit too spicy. Take your hot take and take it somewhere else, man. I don't know if we can hang with this, all right? This is a difficult saying, who can accept it? Aware that his disciples were grumbling, they grumbled often. You might grumble through this series. Hang with us, okay? Aware that they were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, um, does this offend you? Does this offend you? We live in a day and age where there are some people who are offended about everything, and maybe they shouldn't be, and there are people who are offended about nothing, and maybe they should be. So I wanna ask you a question. Regardless of what you believe about Jesus, or maybe even why you're here today, we can all engage with this question, and here it is. Has Jesus offended you yet? Has Jesus offended you yet? And for some of us, the answer is no, because perhaps we don't listen carefully when it gets tough, or perhaps we dismiss the things that he has said, but for some of us, the answer is yes, and that is a great place to be. Because if the answer is yes, it means you are leaning in with honesty and authenticity. It means you are paying careful attention, not just to the things that you like that he said, but to everything that he has said. And it is good to lean in. Let me tell you why. In fact, let me have Pastor Tim Keller explain why. The late, great Tim Keller, one of my favorite pastors and authors, he once said this. To stay away from Christianity, because part of the Bible's teaching is offensive to you, assumes that if there is a God, he wouldn't have any views that upset you. Does that belief make sense? If you don't trust the Bible enough to let it challenge and correct your thinking, that's what this series is gonna do for us, how could you ever have a personal relationship with God? In any truly personal relationship, the other person, and my wife is really good at this, 
has to be able to contradict you, okay? That's how good, healthy relationships work. And because Jesus is not you, he will offend you. And if you'd say, no, not me, perhaps you're not listening carefully enough, and we should. And here's why. If you don't want all of what Jesus said, you don't want all of who Jesus is. And there are some people, perhaps in the room, and I, I'm in this category from time to time, who have sort of sanitized Jesus. The things that he says that we don't like, the things that are a bit too spicy, we will just sanitize them away. And we are left with a version of Jesus that's actually not Jesus at all. It's a version of him that looks a whole lot like us, as if we were him. It's kind of like going to In-N-Out and ordering what my son orders. We go to In-N-Out and he says, I'll have the cheeseburger uh, minus the meat, the lettuce, the tomato, and the sauce. That's what he orders. And I'm like, bro, that's not a cheeseburger anymore. That is a grilled cheese sandwich, right? It's not a burger anymore. It is something else entirely that he still doesn't even want to eat. But the point is this. You can take away and take away and take away and eventually arrive at something completely different, entirely different. And I am so concerned that there are thousands upon thousands of people who would say, I'm a Jesus follower, I'm a Christian, but the thing they are following is not Christ anymore, it is something different. Some figurehead of lifeless, powerless, dead spiritual ideas. That's not Jesus. And if you had domesticated the king of the universe into a king on the chessboard, if you had domesticated the, the king over all creation into just a, a lab rat, if you've taken the lion of Judah, as he's called, and turned him into a house cat, wouldn't you want to know? I would. And that's what the series can do for us. In fact, I think this is what the series will do. I'll put it on the screen, and then we'll get to our tough text today. When we are uncomfortable with Jesus' truth, it's because we are too comfortable with another's lies. When we find ourselves uncomfortable with the truth that Jesus taught, it is an indicator that we have grown too comfortable with someone else's lies. And the process of moving from lies to truth can feel pretty uncomfortable at times. That's what this series might do for us. We're gonna talk about family this week, exclusivity next week, divorce and remarriage the week after that, and then the whole thing about gouge out your eye the week after that. It's gonna be tough, all right? And my hope, hang with me on this, my hope is that we would all get to a place where Jesus has permission to offend us, where he could offend us again because we are coming face to face with someone who is not us, but bigger and better and more glorious than us. Sound good? Some of you are like, that does not sound good. Hope it sounds good. Here we go, we're gonna get into it in Matthew chapter 10 with our first spicy teaching in the series. And in Matthew 10, Jesus says this, here we go. Do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. And you're like, that doesn't sound like the Christmas songs I used to sing, you know? <laughs> Christmas was about the peace thing, right? Prince of Peace, not a sword, okay. For I have come to turn, and here we go. I've come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother. This next one's the easiest of all. A daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Not, not with you, I'm sure. A man's enemies will be the members of his own household. His own household. Anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. When we read that, maybe you think, wait, what? Jesus, are you, are you serious? What are we supposed to do with this? Um, when I read this, I think back to my favorite family photo of all time, and I brought it with me so you can see how wonderful my family looks. This is my favorite family photo of all time. I think we've got a picture here. We'll throw it, throw it up on the screen. This is us. This is my wife, Carissa, our kids, Nora and Jack, my parents, Bob and Wendy, and uh, my sister and uh, her fiance. I get to do the wedding here in just a couple weeks. This is in Central Oregon on one of our last vacations. I love this picture, and I love this group of people. And Jesus says, I came to bring a sword to that. And I'm like, huh? Jesus, I don't know if you should be saying stuff like that, you know? I mean, this, this is tough. He's the Prince of Peace. He's the one who said people will know that we're his disciples by our love. He's the one that says we should honor our father and mother. The, the one that says 
Wives should respect their husbands. Husbands should love their wives. That parents should treat their kids with gentleness. Okay? And now this, this seemingly contradictory ultimatum, what are we supposed to do with all of this? Now, if you are just thinking, Matthew probably had a bad day when he recorded that for us. You know, he got it a little bit wrong. He's a little grumpy. No, no, no. Luke takes this and levels it up. I mean, Luke in his gospel doubles down. Jesus probably taught this in a couple different ways a couple different times. And he brings in a new word, hang with me, the word hate. Luke records the word hate. And he brings the wife into the picture. Because if you were thinking, well, in the first part, it didn't include wife. It does now, okay? Look at Luke. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus and turning to them, he said, if anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Are you offended yet? I hope so, just a little bit. Now, when we read this, like, I don't know about you, but I think Jesus, um, hate speech is bad speech. You should wrap that up, you know? You're gonna get canceled in the 21st century. You shouldn't be saying this. Now, before we unpack it and solve all this, because we can, uh, I do wanna say this. Some of you are thinking, finally, this is the easiest thing for me to obey in the entire Bible, all right? I got this one down. I've been writing them off for years, you know? Um, that's a different sermon for a different day, all right? Different sermon, different day. You have a different next step than today's sermon. But for those of us who feel stuck in this ultimatum, how do we, how do we solve it? Well, there's, there's three things that we need to be able to do. Um, and it's actually not as hard as you might think. The first thing we need to do is work on the context of the passage. The, th the second thing we need to do is work on what's called a linguistic analysis of the passage, which is to analyze how the language is fitting together, because the way language fits together communicates meaning. And then the third thing we have to do is cross-reference this with some other things that, that we know. And we can do those things, and it doesn't take long. We can do it rather quickly. And as we do it, if you get the sense that you'd like to have some of these tools, you should sign up for SMCCU this fall. I want everybody here to take an SMCCU course at some point this year. Because this isn't just stuff like, I know, and I'm gonna, you know, you gotta come listen to me, and then I tell you how it works, and I'm the smart one. That's not it. This stuff is very simple if you would just decide to commit to it, dedicate some of your time to learning it. So let's do that now context. The context of Matthew and Luke is not how to be a happy family, all right? It's not how to, you know, get married and have kids and the picket fence and the dog. That's not the context of Matthew and Luke. The context is discipleship, and we know that because Jesus is talking about how to be a disciple. He's talking about how to follow, and he's talking about how to take up your cross. So the context, all that surrounds these statements is discipleship, not family. Okay, He's not teaching on family, he's talking about discipleship. Family must somehow relate to discipleship. Got it, that's context. The second thing we need to do is a little linguistic analysis, and we need to work with the word hate here. But we need to compare it to what Matthew uses, which is love more than. Love more than in Matthew, hate in Luke. What do we do with this? Well, your first definition, probably the thing that came to mind when I read hate, is this definition, hostile action. That's what we typically hear when we hear the word hate, hostile action. And that's one meaning of the word, but there's another meaning. It can mean hostile action, but hate can also mean in comparison to something else. Hostile action or in comparison. So there's a, sp a part of speech where an author can use something very intentional commu to communicate a point. Here's the linguistic analysis. There's something called comparative hyperbole. Comparative hyperbole. Hyperbole is taking something and exaggerating it for effect. Comparative hyperbole is exaggerating it compared to something different on the other side. Love and hate would be a comparative hyperbole. Those are compared against each other, contrasted against each other to make a point constantly. Matthew and Luke, it's highlighting that. It's highlighting that for us. So the point is this. Your first impression of the word hate does not need to be the first interpretation of the passage. Rarely is our first impression the correct interpretation, okay? So, we're gonna hold all this loosely. It's about discipleship, not family, okay. Um, hate doesn't mean hostile action, but in comparison, so maybe there's a comparison going on. But let's look at the cross-reference to bring it all together. And to do that, we need to go to Micah chapter seven. Micah chapter seven is where this original theme emerged, okay? Micah is in the Old Testament, he was speaking to Israel, and he says something very important to them where these family themes emerge. Micah chapter seven, picking it up in verse five and then into six. Do not trust a neighbor, put no confidence in a friend, 
Even with the woman who lies in your embrace, guard the words of your lips. And here's where it sounds familiar. For a son dishonors his father, a daughter rises up against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, a man's enemies are the members of his own household. When we read it in the New Testament, it's set off in quotes to let us know this comes from something else being quoted. And it's being quoted from Micah chapter seven. We gotta know what's happening here though. During this time, Israel was combusting from the inside, okay? (laughs) Their culture was disintegrating. Things were deteriorating rapidly as people began to walk away from God. They chose rebellion instead of him, and so things are falling apart from the inside. And yet there was a faithful group, sometimes called a remnant, a group of people who were still remaining faithful to God. But that group was growing smaller and smaller. They were becoming the minority. So Micah, God uses Micah to write to them, say, would you keep going? And when your family comes against you, don't cave in your love for me and don't fall away from me by choosing to side with them. That's the context of Micah. The context of Micah is persecution. It's hostile action from the outside. But the context of Matthew and Luke is what? It's not persecution, remember? It's discipleship. Okay, so we got persecution in Micah, discipleship in Matthew and Luke. This is getting confusing. In fact, Pastor Trevor and I opened our Bibles for quite some time to figure out how to bring this all together. Jesus is not lifting the meaning of Micah and using it in the same way. He says, you know how this happens? Well, it's gonna happen a little bit differently with you now, and here's how we solve it. In Micah, in Micah, they're experiencing an attack from the outside that would affect the inside. But in Matthew and Luke, it's something going on on the inside that will affect the outside. In Micah, they're the problem out there. In Matthew and Luke, you're the problem, and it's in here. Whoa. That's what Jesus is doing. He's taking the Micah passage, he's repurposing it. In Micah, the problem is out there. In Matthew and Luke, the problem is in here. This is persecution from the outside. This is a discipleship problem on the inside. And to put it all together in a very simple way, now that we've done the work, the point is this, and some of you knew this already, but now we've done the work to support this conclusion. The Jesus family doesn't come first, he does. The Jesus family doesn't come first, he does. Now, before you misunderstand me and take your family and book it out of here, listen, we have a playground in our lobby, okay? We love families. Oh my goodness, do we love families here at SMCC. We want your family to thrive, you know? We want your kids to have the best experience possible, your students to have an amazing time all year long with everything that we do. We put a ton of resources into serving your family. Men, we want you to be the best husbands and the best fathers possible. Ladies, we want you to be best wives, best mothers possible. Oh my goodness, do we care about families. And we know that families thrive best when the family doesn't come first. Families thrive best when Jesus comes first. Okay? And that's what he is teaching here. That is the what behind this difficult passage. But what's the why? What's the why behind it? Why did he need to say this? Why does he still want us to know this? Because in the first century and even now, there is a strong pull for all of us to take a gift that God has given us and turn it into our God. To take the gift that's a good thing, turn it into a God thing, and actually worship it more than him. It's called idolatry. And let me tell you, especially in the state of Utah, let's be close to home, this happens all the time, okay? I meet families often who show up here and it's like, you know what, this is like the family day and I love that and this should be family day, but let me just be really, really clear. Jesus is not an additive into the family. He's not the butler, he's not the nanny, okay? He's not the insurance policy and if you get a little bit of him, your family's gonna be better and your family's the God, so you bring Jesus in because after all, he worships your family too. That is not how this goes. This is not what Jesus is teaching about family. We are to love him more than we love our families. Now, some of you are thinking, Eric, you are off your rocker today, man. That heat's got you fired up, you know? If your AC go out at the house, what's wrong? You know, you, you're a little radical today. Let me get more radical and double down on this, okay? Let me say it in this way. This is oh so important. If you don't love God more than your family, your family might come to hate you. I decided to keep that word in there. You know, it's kept in the passage, it's kept in the text. If you don't love God more than your family, your family might come to hate you. Let me explain what I mean. If you worship your family more than God, 
you will put a burden and an expectation on your family that your family members will come to resent. If you expect your wife or your husband or your kids to love you unconditionally, satisfy your needs, secure your worth, justify your existence, and save you, you will put a pressure onto them that they were never meant to carry. It will crush them. They will be miserable. They'll come to resent you. Maybe they'll grow up and hate you. I'm serious. This absolutely happens. Now, moment of humility, guys. I'm learning this as much as anybody, okay? Yesterday, we're at the soccer field, okay? Nora's playing the game. I get a little fired up when it comes to sports. She's playing forward. This is Nora the whole time. She's looking at the weeds. She's got her legs crossed. She's twirling around, and I'm on the sidelines. I'm like, move your feet. Pick it up, you know? And she looks at me, and she looks back, and she still doesn't move. She's holding her ground, you know? And I'm like, come on, you know? As if I was still playing soccer, you know? And, um, and Carissa calls me. Uh, we're driving home. We had taken two cars because we went to hockey after that. And she's like, you need to have a conversation with your daughter when you get home. I'm like, yeah, because her game was terrible. No, that's not it. <laughs> you put a pressure on her that she couldn't carry, and instead of her rising to the occasion, she goes this way on you, bro. Well, she Chris doesn't say, bro. That's what I tell myself. I'm going this way, you know? And I'm like, well, if I need to talk to Nora about this, you should have seen Jack at hockey practice today, you know? <laughs> I'm coaching his team. Jack once told me with tears through his face mask, Dad, you're too hard on me. I am trying to learn something. That my kids' success, their sports career, their grades, their careers, their wealth, whatever it is, it does not justify my life. And if I need them to justify my life, I will make them miserable I will crush them with those expectations. So we need to learn that Jesus came to bring a sword to the idea that our families are our gods, okay? And if we put that pressure on our kids, they will come to resent us. If you expect your spouse to love you perfectly, they will resent you for that because they can't. They just can't. You will grow to hate that situation and they probably will too. But, oh, and listen to this. If you trust Jesus supremely, if he's the one that secures your worth and your identity, you will have a well with which to draw from to then go and pour your life out in love to your family. This is how it's designed to be. That he would come first, there'd be a well of richness from a relationship with him, and now we could pour that out to our families, we could love them well. Those families have a joy and delight that cannot be taken away. By the way, if your kids do justify your existence, there's a day that it will all be taken away. Don't bank on that type of love, okay? And so in Utah, I love raising my kids here, all right? And Utah is a fantastic place to raise our kids. There's so many fun things for kids. There's pools and there's parks and there's museums. I absolutely love raising my kids in Utah. Everybody else does too. There's a lot of kids in Utah, okay? Um, but I think for Utah, we need to know this. Um, and I chose this passage on purpose for us because we need to be separated from, that's the idea behind the Greek word for hate, separated from the idea that our families are our gods. In fact, let me say it like this. The family unit, the family unit is more of a threat to following Jesus than essential to following Jesus. More of a threat. What do I mean by that? Well, in Micah, a threat from the outside, and Matthew and Luke, a threat from the inside, okay? The family unit, more of a threat not a pathway to salvation, the family, not a stairway to heaven. If you're single, this brings a lot of hope, you know? The family is not essential to salvation. In fact, it can get in the way of us following Jesus as disciples. Family is a gift to steward, not a God to be worshiped. St. Augustine, famous theologian, once said this. It's so important. He says, the essence of sin, the essence of sin is disordered love. At the heart of the matter, most of the problems we see in the world, it's not us loving the wrong things. It's us loving the right things in the wrong order. In the wrong order. Now, there's a story in the Old Testament that puts all of this into living color for us. It's a story that offends me. It offends me a little less than it used to. It's a story that bothers me at times, but it's a beautiful story. In Genesis chapter 22, Abraham has this moment. If you don't know the story of Abraham, Abraham had been waiting for a child for years and years, decades. And God comes through on his promise, a son named Isaac. And then God asks Abraham to sacrifice Isaac. And I always thought, why? And if family comes first for you, this is a story that you just probably will struggle to wrap your mind around. But I think in light of what we talked about, we can make sense 
of this. In Genesis 22, verse nine, we see this. When they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. Here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God. Now I know that God is the supreme thing. He comes first. He is your priority. You love him. Because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son, you can have your son back. What a story. God had delivered on this promise. But when we are waiting for things, when we long for things, when we desire things, and we have those things, it is so easy to take the gift and turn it into a God. And Abraham not to do that. And he didn't. He was gonna treat the son as a gift from God, and if so be, give him back. Make sure that Abraham's love ordered correctly, prioritized love. Have you done that? Are you able to prioritize your loves, to order your loves correctly in light of this difficult teaching? Now, some of us are on the far other side of this, and your family needs more of your time. It needs more of your attention. It needs to be served by you. It needs to be led by you. It's a different sermon for a different day. For those of us, though, who are tempted to put family first, my invitation is for you to order your loves with a little bit of homework. I wanna give you a little bit of homework. You don't have to do it. You don't have to bring it back next week. No one's gonna check on it and grade it. But I wanted to give you something to work on. This week, I'd love for you to list out everything that you love in life, everything that you love. List it, family, your kiddos by name, your spouse, the last vacation you took, the car you drive, okay? Look at your Instagram, you'll see what you love. Look at your bank account, look at your calendar, look at your garage, you'll probably find some things you love, okay? And then order those things one to whatever. And I hope that Jesus is ordered first. And when that happens, you will then be able to enjoy everything else fully as God designed it to be. The bottom line of today's message is this. The teaching is demanding. Teaching is demanding, but guys, um, our teacher, well, he's forgiving. Teaching is demanding, but the teacher is forgiving. And I hope today you would discover why Jesus says he comes first. Because when we order our loves correctly, we experience great joy. Jesus does not command our worship or command we put him first because he's insecure and arrogant. It's the most loving thing for him to do because he knows that when we love him first, everything else is aligned correctly, okay? So I just wanna end with this. Remember, remember, remember. Sometimes the hardest truths to learn are the ones we need to learn the most. Let me pray for us and we'll respond. Jesus, I'm grateful for the opportunity to study such an incredible passage with a great group of people to learn some things, but to apply it deeply into the tough parts of our lives. I just pray that we would see you as a supreme thing in our lives, knowing that what you offer to us can't be offered by anyone or anything else. And help us know that when we get that wrong, we put a pressure on people that crushes them. We put a pressure on them they can't live up to, which crushes us. So why would we do that? But Jesus, we trust you now. That's the supreme thing. Help us over the next few minutes order our loves around you. And even this week, through the power of your Holy Spirit, help us reflect on the way our love is actually ordered. And may we put you first as you wanted with this hard teaching. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us for today's message and trusting us with your time. If you'd like to connect with one of our pastors or staff, you can easily do that by visiting smccutah.org slash connect. When you fill out that quick form, they will get back to you within a few days and be able to connect with you. As well, if you'd like to know more about taking a next step at SMCC, you can easily look at what next steps we have by visiting smccutah.org slash next steps. And lastly, if you found today's message both hopeful and helpful, I would encourage you to do maybe one of two things. First, you can share this message with someone that would find it helpful. And you can also choose to partner with us financially so that more people can see messages like this. You can find more information on what that looks like by visiting smccutah.org slash give. Again, thank you for joining us today, and I hope to see you at one of our locations soon.